Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology and Metabolic Institute Grand Rounds. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker who really needs no introduction, Dr. Sangeeta Kashyap, who is a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. She um, has been a lead investigator of multiple trials, NIH funded. One of them was the Stampede trial, which we all know about. She is also the associate editor for the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism and has been the associate program director for the Endocrinology Fellowship Training Program here at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Um, it, uh, nobody would be better than her to tell us more about uh, the triumphs and challenges of a multi-center trial of metabolic surgery versus medical therapy for type 2 diabetes. Dr. Mm -hmm. Kashyap, please. Thank you, Dr. Macon, for the very kind invitation. Uh, today, I'll focus on our efforts to study metabolic surgery as compared to our current medical treatments for diabetes from a multicenter trial perspective. And the trial, the multicenter trial, is called ARMS. Next, please. So these are my relevant disclosures. Next. So the Stampede trial uh, was a landmark study. Um, it was a unicenter randomized control trial of various metabolic procedures, uh, surgical procedures versus lifestyle and medical treatment for the treatment of diabetes, type two diabetes in patients with mild and moderate obesity. It was begun in 2005 and these same patients are enrolled in 2018 in a multi-center five-year consortium trial examining the long-term durability of various metabolic surgical procedures on diabetes outcome. Clearly, the progress made from a multi-center trial to, uh, from a unicenter trial to a multi-center trial is really a triumph for team science. And we certainly could not have come this far without the altruism of our research subjects who were seeking something that really wasn't available at that time, and that is remission of diabetes. I also want to acknowledge the entire research team and um, the generous funding from both our industry and our um, NIDDK sponsors. I also want to recognize Dr. Pott for his expertise in clinical trial design and Dr. Schauer for his vision in shaping the field of metabolic and bariatric surgery. And it really was a combined team effort. Um, next, please. So this is the, uh, a photograph of the investigators in the consortium trial. So the, the sites include Cleveland Clinic, um, Brigham and Women's, uh, Joslin Diabetes Center and University of Washington. Uh, the data coordinating center is uh, being done at Cleveland Clinic. Next, please. So my objectives are to demonstrate the rationale for a multi-center trial of metabolic surgery versus medical therapy for diabetes, to identify some of the outcomes of the four unicenter randomized trials of metabolic surgery for diabetes, and to identify the objectives and study design of the, the consortium trial. I'll also share with you some preliminary data, really of the baseline characteristics of the multicenter cohort. Next. So we, we know that it is possible to achieve diabetes remission with weight loss. And some very elegant studies done by Dr. Klein's group shows that even moderate weight loss of 5% body weight improves multi-organ insulin sensitivity and beta cell function. When we are able to achieve even greater weight loss, that is 11 to 16%, we see further increases in insulin action at the level of the muscle and further weight loss greater than 16% achieved in some participants in this study, um, the results show that there was a reversal of adipose tissue inflammation. All of these factors obviously contribute to beta cell dysfunction and apoptosis, 
So weight loss is a very prominent goal to shoot for, for our patients. Next. However, in the clinical setting, we all know that weight is a very complicated matter. There are multiple targets um, that influence body weight. Some of them we can influence. Uh, and some of them we really don't have very much control over, that is genetics and age, et cetera. But for the clinician, it's important to consider weight as a multifactorial disease and um, something that requires uh, us to tease out factors that we can optimize for a patient. But in the clinical trial setting, a lot of these factors are controlled for, and um, therefore, it's easier to interpret the results. Next. The Look Ahead trial was a very large randomized controlled trial that examined intensive lifestyle intervention versus usual care for patients with type 2 diabetes who were overweight. The primary endpoint was to look at the effect of intensive lifestyle intervention on cardiovascular disease and mortality. And these figures show you the weight trajectory, changes in waist circumference, physical activity, and physical fitness. And you, as you can see from these graphs, uh, intensive lifestyle treatment did work very well. And in fact, the results were most prominent at about a year. However, following from one from year one to year 10, there was weight recidivism, although at, there were still benefits that were seen at eight to 10 years of follow-up. There were similar patterns that oh, we can see in terms of waist circumference, and the, the reduction in weight correlated very strongly with the reduction of uh, hemoglobin A1c. Physical fitness uh, also was markedly increased in the first year and gradually over time it attenuated. And the same thing could be said for um, A1C levels. Next. Part of the reason for weight recidivism is related to metabolic adaptations to weight loss. And this slide shows you some of the changes that occur after a patient has undergone weight loss through diet and exercise. So um, there are increases in hunger signals, namely ghrelin and reduction in satiety, hor satiety hormones, PYY, CCK, GLP, uh, reductions in leptin. Um, and, and there's also a decrease in energy expenditure because there's a reduction in body mass specifically lean body mass, which is important for our metabolism. And this creates an energy deficit gap. Um, a lot of these adaptations were built as defense mechanisms for the body uh, to protect us from starvation. But it's the same reason why it's very difficult for patients to sustain long-term weight loss. Next. However, when we look at the percent of weight loss, uh, weight changes at year eight, which is shown here uh, for patients with diabetes, you can see that more than 50%, a majority of patients were able to lose uh, between five to greater than 10% weight loss as compared to the control group. And a lot of these uh, results were attributed to the increase in activity uh, 175 minutes a week of activity, uh, support group sessions uh, that met monthly, uh, the incorporation of meal replacements into the diet, and generally a, a hypocaloric diet that was uh, defined as 1,200 to 1,800 calories a day. Next. The benefits of weight loss were also seen in the look ahead uh, trial cohort. There were improvements in glucose and lipid control, improvements in blood pressure, less sleep apnea, improvement of uh, hepatic steatosis, less depression, less urinary incontinence, um, less severe kidney disease and retinopathy, so important complications of diabetes, 
um, maintenance of physical mobility and improvement in quality of life, uh, less knee pain, improved sexual function, lowered inflammation, and reduced healthcare costs. Next. However, the, the primary endpoint, which was cardiovascular related mortality, was not seen in the look ahead trial. And one of the interpretations of these data is that perhaps greater and longer sustained weight loss is required to really see a benefit in terms of cardiovascular morbidity mortality, which is the most important cause for our patients with diabetes. Next. So let's look at another uh, non-surgical trial, the DPPOS. So we know that in the di initial diabetes prevention program, which lasted about 2.8 years follow-up, which compared intensive lifestyle, those patients lost about five and a half kilograms, so almost 7% of their body weight. And in the, the, in the metformin group lost two kilograms with the placebo uh, group losing about 0.1 kilograms. Um, what was seen was that weight loss was the primary uh, driver for diabetes prevention. Now these same patients were followed for 10 to 15 years and the intensive lifestyle group regained about 3.5 kilos and had a net weight loss of about 2 kilos at 10 years. The metformin group actually maintained weight loss, and the placebo group had no change. We can see this in a figure in the next slide shown here. So the intensive lifestyle group, as you can see in the blue line, lost the majority of the weight in the first year. And in fact, the, the weight loss at the first year was the best predictor of long-term weight loss. But if you look at results over the course of eight years, um, there was weight regain. And in fact, uh, when you look at the final outcomes, metformin group actually lost more weight than the lifestyle intervention group. So we always consider metformin as an important treatment for patients with prediabetes. It doesn't result in acute weight loss, but it's very important for maintenance of long-term weight loss. Uh, and that's our rationale for the incorporation of metformin in terms of weight loss. Next slide. So the predictors of long-term weight loss in this study were uh, greater one-year weight loss. Um, there were other predictors as well in the lifestyle group, so older age and not having diabetes uh, in the family um, were, were important indicators. And the cumulative diabetes incidence rates over 15 years were lower among those who achieved more than 5% weight loss than those who achieved less than 5% weight loss. So th these are some important outcomes of DPPOS. Next slide. So now let's, let's talk about weight loss in the context of metabolic surgery. So we all know about the Swedish obesity study. Um, this was a study that was started in 1987, enrolled um, several thousand patients. It was not a randomized trial. It was a prospective uh, observational study. And the majority of um, patients underwent banding or vertical banded gastroplasty or had gastric bypass. And the non-surgical group uh, had usual care, diet, and uh, exercise counseling. And, and as you can see, these are the weight trajectories that are mapped out for almost 20 years. Surgery leads to very effective and durable weight loss as compared to usual care, which really didn't result in any significant changes over the course of 20 years. Um, you can see also that even with uh, metabolic surgery, great, the greatest weight loss is seen at year one, followed by weight recidivism. However, people in gastric bypass lost almost 35% of their body weight and at 20 years, we're able to maintain about 25% of their body weight. So um, clearly a testament to the durability of these procedures. I do want to point out that the patients enrolled in, the, in these studies, observational studies, were very different than those that we see in our practice. 
They're primarily um, female, almost 80%. Their BMI is closer to 50, whereas in diabetic patients, average BMI is about 31, 32. And there was a lack of minorities that are seen in these type of studies as compared to diabetes that occurs naturally in the community. Next slide. But this study reported um, something very encouraging. They showed that at two years and at 10 years, there was a recovery from diabetes. That is, uh, there was normalization of hemoglobin A1C seen at both two years and 10 years. At two years, in 72% of the participants, and in 10 years, in 36% of the participants. Um, and then there was also improvements that were seen in hypertension and in a hyperuricemia, which are all linked to metabolic syndrome in patients with diabetes. Next slide. And when you look at uh, the ultimate endpoint, that is mortality, there was a reduction in mortality, almost 30%. And this has been also replicated in other long-term observational studies. There was a reduction in mortality related to reduced MIs and also reduction in cancer. And we know that in obese patients, there's an increased incidence of various colorectal and reproductive cancers, uh, uterine cancer, especially in women. Next slide. So um, one of our uh, bariatric surgeons, Dr. Armenian, recently reported the effects of metabolic surgery on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity. These were published in JAMA. Uh, next slide. He uh, performed a case control matched analysis of patients, almost 2,000 patients who underwent uh, metabolic surgery and matched them to 11,000 non-surgical patients. This is a table of their baseline characteristics. Uh, patients had an average age of about 52, 65% female. Their BMI was uh, about 42, 45. Um, majority of them were white race. Um, many of them had hypertension. Uh, many of them did not have coronary artery disease. Uh, in terms of diabetes, their A1C was well controlled, uh, about 30% were on insulin, and the LDL were, was under 100, which is what we, we target for our patients. Uh, next slide. When you look at the composite outcomes of metabolic surgery versus uh, usual care, you can see that the graphs start separating at year two. Um, the incidence of MACE was 30% in metabolic surgery and 47% in non-surgical controls. When we look at a three-component MACE, um, there was a 17% incidence in metabolic surgery and 27% in non-surgical uh, controls, hazard ratio being 0.62. Next slide. How about other the effects of metabolic surgery on microvascular complications in diabetes. So there have been 10 studies that have uh, met the inclusion criteria. There were three randomized control trial cohorts that were included in this analysis. One was prospective and three uh, retrospective observational studies, three case control studies, and the duration of follow-up was almost 15 years. Uh, so this included 17,000 patients. Their mean BMI was 43 versus 40 for the uh, non-surgical group. Uh, the mean duration of diabetes was about 6%, with about 34% being on insulin at baseline. Next slide. And uh, this is a force plot um, that shows you that there was an improvement in the incidence of microvascular complications that you can see in the randomized studies done above and the case control studies shown in the middle and the observational studies shown below. So overall, the incidence was much lower in the metabolic surgery groups versus the non-surgical cohorts. Next slide. However, these were all Many of these studies were non-randomized, and it's important to do randomized control trials to, so that we can 
um, equalize some of the baseline characteristics, which might be confounders. So the RISE consortium trial was an important study because it looked at uh, metformin use versus lap banding in patients with prediabetes and very early recent onset type 2 diabetes. And these were randomized control trial data for two years on body weight, on fasting glucose, A1C levels, and two-hour glucose levels. And what was interesting is that, as expected, weight loss was far greater with lap banding than metformin. However, when you look at the metabolic endpoints, that is beta cell function, fasting glucose, A1C levels, there was no difference in the metabolic outcome of lap banding versus metformin in patients with recent onset diabetes. So I think these type of data are very important to generate um, and really will guide our treatment for patients with prediabetes and diabetes. Next slide. So let's look at um, some of the pilot studies that were done. Um, so these are all pilot randomized control trials and uh, Stampede was uh, one of the largest ones done at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, the other studies were the SLIM T2D done in Joslin, Tribetes done in Pittsburgh, SOLID trial done at Temple, Crossroads done with University of Washington, and the IDEALS trial that was done at Hopkins. Next trial. So the lifestyle approaches that were used in these studies um, varied significantly. And, and I think um, lifestyle approach is a, a moving target. But in the Tribetes study um, and in our trial, uh, the lifestyle medical treatment was modeled after DPP and look ahead study um, delivered by a multidisciplinary intervention team. The first six months, there were weekly in-person sessions. From months seven to 12, a half in-person and phone sessions. Yearly, um, there was a low-touch monthly contact. Um, and the program included both behavioral lessons, self-monitoring, diet and exercise counseling, and use of meal replacement. Next slide. And for the Tribeti study, which was done in Pittsburgh, the inclusion criteria were age between uh, 25 to 55, BMI far lower than what we've seen in the SOS study, that is BMI of 30 to 40, and they all had confirmed type 2 diabetes. You can see from this flow diagram, there were a huge number of patients that were screened, and ultimately, um, only 69 patients proceeded to randomization with 20 in the gastric bypass arm, 21 in the adjustable band arm, and 20 in the intensive lifestyle arm. And um, data, these patients were followed initially for the first year outcome and eventually for five year outcomes. And the retention was very high, it was 90%. Next slide. So here are the changes in weight that are graphed out over five years as expected. Um, the gastric bypass patients lost the most amount of weight, uh, both at one year and five years. And the lap banding group uh, lost about uh, 15 to 20% initially of body weight and closer to about 15% at year five. The intensive lifestyle group um, lost about 9% initially in the first year, and then at five years, maintained about 5% weight loss. Next slide. And these are the uh, number of uh, remission cases, that is uh, patients who were able to achieve an A1C of 6.5% or less and did not require medications for diabetes. So obviously, Patients in the intensive lifestyle group all required medication, so those are all 0%. But you can see in the gastric bypass, 60% initially and 40% and then 30% at five years. With the lap banding, it was 29% initially, then about 19% at 
seen at five years. Um, so even with surgery, there is an attenuation of the effect. Uh, and what's been shown over and over again is that the earlier the duration of diabetes, the less severe the diabetes, the greater the chances for diabetes remission. Also, the um, younger age groups uh, certainly achieve remission greater than the older age groups. Next slide. However, these studies brought out something very important um, and that randomizing patients to surgery and non-medical therapies is extremely challenging. And you can see this, you know, they screened almost six, 700 patients and only 10% were successfully randomized. So these patients are a very highly select group of patients. And, and many would argue they do not, uh, they do not represent uh, diabetes in the community or what we see in our clinic. And I think that's a very important point to bring out. Um, so there's also dropouts that were noted. So 11% post-randomization dropouts in, this, in the Tribetes and SLIM trials, almost 25% in the Crossroad trials. Um, and, you know, what I noted was that patients who wanted to be randomized were patients who were really medically refractory. They were on insulin, they were on multiple treatments for diabetes and still not able to achieve glycemic control. So they were more open to the thought of having surgery for diabetes. Next slide. Insurance is an, another very important consideration. So, you know, in these trials, the BMI was between 30 to 40. As we all know, um, bariatric surgery is not covered for patients with BMI in the 30 to 35 categories. So there had to be alternative funding sources to support these patients. Um, there was also limited support for lifestyle intervention. As we know, um, many insurance um, companies may not approve um, dietary visits um, or you know, uh, visits for uh, treatment of obesity. So these were issues that, we, that were difficult to harmonize, I would say, between the two groups and was clearly a, a, a source of contention. Next slide. Let's look at the crossroad trial. This was done at University of Washington. So this was a randomized trial. Again, the BMI was between 30 to 40. Uh, they looked at standard uh, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass and medical care or intensive medical lifestyle treatment. Their lifestyle treatment was very strongly influenced by the exercise component, aerobic exercise, hypocaloric diet, uh, really using the state of art um, or the latest medical treatments in terms of therapeutics we had for type 2 diabetes based on the ADA and EAST guidelines. Next slide. So for the exercise, the um, participants engaged in 45 minutes of aerobic exercise more than five days a week, it was supervised, there was a personal dietitian weekly group sessions, food records that were uh, asked to be maintained. Next slide. And these were the, the baseline characteristics of that cohort. So uh, again, um, age in the 50s, the BMI um, was about a little bit higher, 37, 38. Um, they also did body composition. You could see that uh, many of these patients, their body fat was was fairly high, it was almost 47%. They had 80% um, were female in the surgical group and 58% were female in the medical lifestyle group. Uh, the A1C was fairly well controlled, 7.7 .7 in surgical and 7.3%. Next slide. Next slide. So this is their data at the primary endpoint, a diabetes remission at one year. You could see that uh, it was 60% with gastric bypass. 
and about 6% in the intensive lifestyle group. So far lower than what we um, expected, you know, based on look ahead and based on DPPAOS. Next slide. And finally, the stampede trial. So there were many, many patients that were screened and um, ultimately uh, 108, 150 patients were randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one format. So 50 were in the intensive medical therapy group alone, 50 were in the medical therapy plus gastric bypass, and 50 in the medical therapy and sleep, uh, sleep gastrectomy group. Uh, we had 90% retention. There were some patients who uh, immediately dropped out after randomization. Uh, next slide. And our patients, um, I would say their BMI was a little bit lower than the other trials. Uh, our A1C, however, was higher. A majority of our patients were on more than three uh, agents to control their diabetes, and over 50% were on insulin at baseline. Next slide. And so this table shows you the primary and secondary endpoints at five years. Uh, um, so in terms of diabetes remission, which we defined as an A1C of 6% or less with or without medication was achieved by 29% in gastric bypass, 23% in the sleeve, 5% in the medical treatment. A majority of patients were able to achieve um, an A1C of 7% or less, which is the ADA criteria. So almost 50 or 49% in the surgical groups versus 20% in the medical group. There was relapse of glycemic control that was noted. So initially, um, we looked at those who were able to achieve a A1C of 6% or less at one year versus five years. So the relapse rate was about 40% in the bypass and 30% in the um, sleeve group. I'm sorry, it was 50% in the sleeve group. There were significant changes in metabolic syndrome components, including an improvement in HDL levels and a dramatic reduction in triglyceride levels as compared to the medical treated group. Next slide. Here you can see the change in BMI um, over the course of five years. And uh, we can see that the A1C um, did, was not determined whether patients came, were enrolled with a BMI less than 35 or greater than 35. And this really argues the point that perhaps metabolic surgery would not, should not be defined by a BMI of 35 cutoff um, because the results in diabetes outcomes did not matter. Next slide. We actually looked at whether... Um, what is the impact of the weight trajectory uh, following bariatric surgery on long-term glycemic control for patients with diabetes? And what we saw was that the participants who had the greatest weight loss in the first year were more likely to have a controlled A1C at five years. Uh, this was especially the case with gastric bypass. Now, with the sleeve gastrectomy group, there's greater weight regain that's seen. And in those patients, weight regain did play a factor in terms of long-term diabetes control. Next slide. What about the effects of surgery? Now, these are data from Stampede on renal and uh, ophthalmic outcomes. Because the cohort was very small and most of the cohort did not have diabetes complications at baseline, we were really not able to see any significant differences between the three groups in terms of renal and ophthalmic outcomes. And we're hoping that with a larger group with longer follow-up that we will be able to capture some of these important endpoints. Next slide. But these Feasibility and pilot randomized studies were very important because they did, next, they did highlight the importance of referring patients with diabetes with the BMI of over 40 for metabolic surgery, next. And for patients with BMI of 35 to 39 who are not well controlled with medication should also be considered for referral. Next. 
And for patients with a lower BMI, that is 30 to 35, um, and under the care of specialists, endocrinologists, not well controlled with medications, should be considered for metabolic surgery. Next. And always should be performed in high volume programs that um, display excellence and have multidisciplinary care provided. So these are the guidelines that were in place in 2017, published in Diabetes Care. Next. So we, what we did in the consortium trial is the four largest trials, uh, Cleveland, Boston, Seattle, and Pittsburgh merged. Next. Into, and were pooled. So all of these patients were pooled into a consortium trial called the Alliance of Randomized Trials of Medicine versus Metabolic Surgery in Type 2 Diabetes. So patients who had undergone gastric bypass or sleeve or lap banding were included in the surgical arm and in the medical treatment arm, um, patients that were treated with diet, with exercise, and with medication. And the follow the, the follow-up is going to be five years for this trial. The first aim is to really look at improvement in A1C and the durability over time. The second aim is to look at safety outcomes. So we will look at efficacy and counteract that with safety over five years. And the last aim is really to look at what are the clinical determinants of those that achieve diabetes remission versus those that do not. Next slide. And these are, again, to highlight some of the specific aims. Uh, so the first aim, again, is to compare the durability of glycemic control assessed by A1C. Um, the secondary outcomes are looking at the rate of glycemic control, the rate of change in diabetes remission, and the rate of diabetes relapse after initial re remission. Next slide. The second aim, if we break that down into primary and second, uh, secondary outcomes, uh, we are going to look at the longer term efficacy and safety outcomes in patients randomized. We'll also look at the percent change over time in weight, in BMI, in cardiometabolic risk factors, notably lipids, blood pressure, albuminuria, cardiometabolic score, and quality of life. We'll also look at safety outcomes in terms of the major adverse events, hospitalizations, additional GI procedures, deaths, and um, serious hypoglycemia requiring assistance or hospitalization. Slide. We'll also look at clinical predictors of response versus no response. And we hypothesized that the baseline age, diabetes duration, pre-intervention, insulin use, and A1C levels are going to be some of the indicators that are going to be responsible for long-term uh, diabetes remission outcomes. Next. So the impact of this consortium trial is going to, we hope, will be significant. It will provide the largest body of long-term level one evidence to inform clinical decision-making and it will really afford us an opportunity to look at variety of care that's provided in four different centers. Um, and hopefully these results will be more generalizable than the Unicenter studies that have been performed. Next. Um, so this table really synthesizes all the, the four groups um, and we look and it really aligns some of the baseline characteristics. So um, the age is very similar and there are differences across the sites um, in gender. Uh, I would say also in BMI with slightly lower BMIs that are seen at UPMC and slightly higher in the other sites. Um, the, the percent use of insulin is also variable across slides. Um, and next slide um, will show you, sorry. Uh, the next slide, these are the baseline characteristics again. And the next slide, show you some of the data that was generated at year one. So you can see the remission rates, 
that were uh, generated at the Cleveland site, UPMC, Joslin, and University of Washington. And um, you can also see uh, various definitions of diabetes remission. If we look at A1C of less than 6% with no diabetes medication, uh, the results were about 42% for gastric bypass and stampede, 40% in UPMC, 32% at Joslin, 60% at University of Washington. We define remission as, as A1C less than 6.5% and no medications. These Obviously, the results are a little bit better across all the sites. Next slide. So this is our enrollment. Um, we have uh, contacted and enrolled uh, 304 subjects. Uh, this is the distribution across the four different sites. Um, we had about 86% that responded to initial contact, 94% consented. We have about 95% that have completed uh, annual visits. Next slide. So much of the recruitment has been done. We are now focused on retention. And I will tell you, retention is perhaps the most important challenge that we're facing, especially um, with four different sites. There have been changes in personnel, in retention strategies. Um, also, there's some of the challenges have been to harmonize data collection, uh, de you know, define what we consider as adverse events or anemia. Um, the other thing is, you know, we have to standardize. Since our primary endpoint is based on glycemic control, A1C, we, we chose to have a central lab service so that we could have more uniform um, uh, data distribution. Um, I also wanted to point out that, you know, one of the challenges with retention has been the impact of COVID in the clinical trial. So unfortunately, because of COVID, um, we've had to change our central lab. Our central lab were, was not able, went out of business essentially. Um, we also had to consider doing virtual visits and home hemoglobin A1Cs so that uh, to provide safety for our research participants uh, and, and try to not uh, avoid any gaps in follow-up. Um, so there have been multiple challenges, uh, but we are in the process of harmonizing uh, data collection and accumulating data for all of our, our aims. Next slide. And in summary, I would say multi-center trials for metabolic surgery will clearly allow us greater generalizability of outcomes for patients undergoing metabolic surgery versus intensive lifestyle and medical treatment of diabetes. Long-term follow-up will allow us to determine the impact of various procedures on micro and macrovascular complications and outcomes. We'll also find out what the relapse rate actually is. Uh, for diabetes remission as well. Next slide. Other future directions for our trial, we're also interested in really looking at the, to study the weight variability and trajectories that we see with the various procedures on the impact on diabetes outcomes. And also since some patients sustain diabetes remission long-term, I think it's important to look at what are the effects of these procedures on markers of beta cell function and apoptosis? So these are all exploratory ancillary studies that are in development. Next slide. So clearly we're at a time, we're at a crossroads where we're in, looking at a treatment of diabetes that is diabetes medicine and diabetes metabolic surgery. Next slide. And with that, I would like to conclude the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. That was a very comprehensive look at all the bariatric surgery trials that have been done in the last 20 years. Um, I'm going to kind of read off the comments that I'm seeing from the live chat feature and then ask you the questions. 
One of the things that people have pointed out is uh, the fact that bariatric surgery clearly trumps medical control in our diabetes patients. And something to look at this is these patients had very intensive lifestyle intervention, which under normal insurance coverage conditions is usually not covered. Most of our patients do not have access to a dietitian or an exercise place or so much exercise, I should say, equipment and supervision. So it's interesting to see that even with that much lifestyle intervention, patients with metabolic surgery did much better than patients with lifestyle intervention. Yeah, and I think the data shows that lifestyle works really well for patients early in the disease and the direct trial and, and, you know, DPP, we saw that lifestyle was very effective initially, but, you know, trying to overcome these adaptations that are inbuilt uh, in our bodies to prevent weight regain is really the issue. And that's where anti-obesity pharmacotherapy comes in. And we are using anti-obesity pharmacotherapy for some of the patients. Uh, in these trials. So it'll be nice to be lo- to look at the medical treatment of diabetes, including anti-obesity treatments, uh, and what the long-term effects are going to be on weight and diabetes outcomes. Absolutely. We all have those patients who start checking their sugars five days before their doctor's appointment and start <laughs> dieting and exercising. So yes. That's right. Um, the second thing, I think uh, the comment that is really important is the fact that our patients tend to think of bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery as a way for diabetes remission. One of the things that kinds of, kind of gets forgotten in the discussion is the fact that complication rates might come down as well, especially as you showed your macrovascular complication rates. So I think um, the discussion for metabolic surgery and its advantages in patients with diabetes has to include the complication part as well, not just the fact that they might require no or less medication. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing. Before, we knew that you, you achieve better control of diabetes, less medications, but now there's pretty, there's, you know, accumulating data that suggests you can actually change complications. You can give some patients a vacation from their disease for several years, even if their blood sugars start rising over five years or seven years, that might have a significant impact on, on, you know, trajectory of different complications. So I think that's really important to consider. And, and given that a majority of patients, only one to 2% of patients are referred for this option, I think it's really a shame. And I hope that these type of data will stimulate the primary care, care community, you know, to, to treat diabetes earlier, And for those patients who are medically refractory, where you're increasing insulin, but you're not getting them to the target, consider an alternative treatment, and that is metabolic surgery. Absolutely. You presented very compelling data. Um, Now, I'll come to the questions. One of the questions was that we all have patients who um, gain the weight back. Mm -hmm. And I know you have an extensive experience in this area. So two parts to this. One, uh, have any of these studies recognized the factors or patient, I should say patient factors that govern which patient will regain the weight back or no? And second, has the screening for these patients or how these, um, I should say, protocols work, how have they changed in the last decade or two decades? Yeah, so weight loss is so variable, and there is, uh, in the SOS study, there was 34% weight regain at year six. Some of the things that are critical for maintaining weight loss after surgery are adherence to bariatric support groups and exercise. There's very strong data. Um, I will also say that we have to be more uh, vigilant. So when patients start regaining weight, you have to make a relapse kind of plan for these patients. Um, and a lot of that it also includes pharmacotherapy. So you, there is data show, suggesting that high dose loraglutide as well as fentramine topiramate can be effective in terms of curbing that weight regain. Um, and then often the other thing is uh, having a close collaboration with psychologists is so important because you know eating disorders are so 
closely linked to substance abuse and other mental health issues, that plays a really strong role in terms of weight regain. All right. Um, I think we are running out of time, so I'll end here. Thank you so much, Dr. Kashyap. Again, you make a very compelling case for sending patients to metabolic surgery. And I hope when our primary care physicians view this, you're going to get a lot of referrals in our system. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Take care.